Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today we are going to continue our series on the Faceless Men by taking an in-depth look at the member of this ancient order that we're most intimately familiar with, Jochen Hagar. As we all know, Jochen is the one who gave Arya the Iron Coin, and seems to have been pivotal in her ending up in Braavos. But is he more than just a servant of the many-faced god and a necessary plot device to introduce us to the guild? Well, based on what we learn from Arya's voyage to Bravos and her time spent there serving as an acolyte, we think there is. So, let's do this. So, most of what we learn about the Faceless Men occurs after we have direct access to Jokin, which is important to note because it seems that the order in which George gave us this information could have been the means with which he cleverly hid the fact that Jokin might be something different and even more powerful than just a servant of the Many-Faced God. To illustrate what we mean, we are going to do a little exercise where we go through the information given to us about the Faceless Men, then take that and compare it to what we know about Jokin, and the rules he seems to live by, or, in most cases, completely ignore. First and foremost, we know that the servants of the Many-Faced God must give up their previous identities, along with any free will. This is evident throughout Arya's training where they're systematically breaking her down and trying to replace Arya with no one. Being no one means exactly what it sounds like. You have no desires, no likes, dislikes, or attachments of any kind. As a result, faceless men lack agency. They don't make decisions. They obey the orders that they're given. Life as a servant of the many-faced god consists of a never-ending cycle of discreet assassinations of one specified target after another. And when you finish with one job, you return to the House of Black and White for a new assignment. Discretion is important here, too. And it must be done with no other casualties. This was made readily apparent when Arya was assigned her first target, the insurance merchant and Arya told the kindly man that she was going to have to kill his guards in order to get to the merchant to kill him. The kindly man tells her that the faceless men do not gauge in that sort of butchery, but more importantly, that her task is to kill only those who were chosen by the many-faced god, which is a choice that only he can make. We also know from one of the faceless men team meetings that a servant of the many-faced god cannot kill someone that they know, which is supported by the actions taken by the passengers and crew on the Titan's daughter, which took Arya to the House of Black and White. Pretty much everyone on that ship repeatedly introduced themselves to Arya and gave her gifts so that she would now quote-unquote know them and therefore couldn't end up giving one of them the gift someday. The kindly man reiterated this fact when Arya admits that the names she recites at night are those she wants to kill, and that is the real reason she came to Bravos and the House of Black and White. He told her, Then you have come to the wrong place. It is not for you to say who shall live and who shall die. That gift belongs to him of many faces. We are but his servants, sworn to do his will. So to summarize, in order to be a servant to the many-faced God, number one, a person must abandon their identity and free will. Number two, you can only kill a specific target, no more, no less. Number three, you cannot kill someone that you know personally. Number four, the kill should be done in as couth a manner as possible, so as to not rouse any suspicions. 
oftentimes, making the death look like an accident or misfortune of some kind. Now let's go through Jockin's storyline and see if any of what we learned is evident in the way that Jockin conducts himself. We first meet Jockin in A Clash of Kings, during Arya's trek to the Wall with Yorn and the other Night's Watch recruits. He's in a cage with the other fell demons from the Black Cells, Rorge and Biter, and when compared to his companions, he seems like a relatively pleasant guy. He's good-looking, has a pleasant demeanor, and for all intents and purposes, seems out of place. But for our purposes here, the most important fact about this is that he was in the Black Cells. How does a man with his skill set get caught? It seems borderline impossible, which almost seems to indicate that he wanted to get caught. But how would sitting in a Black Cell help him accomplish anything? It doesn't seem like it would. We know from his two kills at Harrenhal that this guy knows how to kill someone without anyone thinking anything of it. We also know that he can change his face with a simple wave of his hand. So even if there were gold cloaks or someone else on his heels after he committed a crime, all it would have taken is a quick dip around a corner and a swipe of his hand for him to be home free. So, how does a shapeshifter with an impeccable ability to kill someone without anyone even knowing a murder took place end up in a black cell? That's a question that we've pondered quite a bit, and the only conclusion we were able to draw is that he was in the black cells because that's where he wanted to be. However, even this explanation seems to fall short, as the guys in the black cells are usually either executed or left there to rot. And he was only freed from his black cell because Yorin showed up looking for recruits for the Night's Watch. So, was his plan to become a recruit of the Night's Watch? That does seem to be the only way that someone can get out of the black cells alive. So it seems possible, but if that was his plan, why didn't he go to the Wall after he escaped from Harrenhal? Nothing about this guy makes sense. So, we've barely started breaking this guy down, and already it's becoming clear that his actions don't line up with what we know about the Faceless Men. So, what else is there? Well, prior to Harrenhal, our access to him was limited, with his only noteworthy action being the fact that he appeared to be the first to notice that Arya was a girl. But after they're separated, we don't see him again until both he and Arya are at Harrenhal. There, he sneaks into the kitchens to see Arya in the Black of Night, so he can tell her that because she saved him, Rorge, and Biter from being burned alive, three lives were owed. At first, this seems like a reasonable and almost logical notion, albeit in a really messed up way. But when phrased as he put it, only death can pay for life, which is as close to a quote-unquote rule of magic that exists within the story, most of us just accept it at face value and don't give it another thought. But faceless men don't get to make such decisions. The kindly man made this abundantly clear, yet here's Jockin making such a decision all on his own. But more on that in a minute. While en route to inform Jockin of her first name, Arya bumps into Rorge, and when she tells him that she needs to speak with Jockin, she sees something that seems significant. There was a hint of fear in his eyes. This monster, that is Rorge, fears Jockin. When she gets to the bathhouse, she creeps up on Jockin, quiet as a shadow. Yet, he hears her anyways, and opens his eyes. Arya wonders how he could have hurt her, and he responded to her thought by telling her that it was her shoes that gave her away. Now, this could be a simple case of someone anticipating what the other person is thinking using logic, and then responding verbally to what they're assuming the other person is thinking. Or it could be something else. Again, there'll be more on this in a minute. Arya gives him the name and then another, and both kills are done with faceless men precision. The first dies in what appears to have been a freak accident, 
and the second was attacked and killed by his own dog, which is interesting and could possibly indicate that Jockin is capable of skin changing. So, I guess technically we could say that these two kills seem to be in line with the rules, as he killed these two men who we don't think that he knew, and no one was the wiser. Not wanting to give up the power that Jockin has given her with these three kills, Arya sits on the third for a while, and Jockin starts pressing her for a name, which makes sense because it seems to be the entire purpose of his trip to Harrenhal. He seems to have wanted to find Arya and get three names from her, kill them, then leave, which he did after he made the third kill. One day, while in the godswood practicing swordplay with some sticks, Arya is startled by Jockin's sudden approach, and she asks him if Jockin is his real name. He replied by saying, Some men have many names. Weasel, Ari, Arya. He then went on to explain, A man knows, my lady of Stark. Now, this is mind-blowing. How the hell does he know who she is? It's one thing to figure out that she's a girl. Faceless men are, after all, taught to be very observant. But knowing who Arya is is something altogether different. One person knows who she is, and Gendry most certainly didn't tell him. This seemed to us to be another possible example of him potentially being able to read someone's mind because there doesn't really seem to be another explanation for how he managed to figure out who Arya is. In any event, he presses her for a third name, and when she asks him if there are any limitations on who he will kill by asking if he would kill even his own father, Jockin replied, A man's sire is long dead, but did he live, and did you know his name? He would die at your command. Okay, this is a clear violation of the rule which states a servant to the many-faced god cannot kill someone that they know. I guess it's possible that Jack had never met his father, but the way he says it, it implies that he places no such limitations on himself. He'll kill anyone, regardless of whether he knows them or not. So now that we've established that Jacken is no ordinary faceless man, that leaves us with a big question. What in the mother F is this guy? Well, the answer to that question is going to have to wait for part two.